The preservation of video games is a challenge that has proven to only get more and more difficult over the years. For those of you wondering, I am using the correct word when I say challenge. Unlike other forms of media like books or movies where preserving them is on the more simple side, due to the complexity of video games as a whole, preserving them is much more difficult. Books can be reprinted or copied and pasted into personal files on someone's computer in the case of an ebook. Movies can be simply downloaded and stored on just about any storage device out there. From there, they can either remain on the computer and be played via a media player or burned onto a disc to give another example. Video games, on the other hand, are a lot more complicated, to the point that the preservation of them has become a skill. I'm not trying to downplay the preservation of books, movies, or anything else when saying that, but the complexity of video games, and therefore the complexity of their preservation, cannot be simply overlooked. As if video games games being complex on their own wasn't enough, the diplomacy of those video games is complex as well. Some companies aren't willing to put official means of access to those games onto their consoles, be it emulation or remasters. And for any companies that do, there's the possibility that the emulation isn't the best quality or the remaster is jeopardized in some way, be it the remaster being flat out poor or the remaster suffering from publisher demands. Online only games have an expiration date where once the servers are shut down in the future, however short or long that future is, the game is dead. Projects such as Insignia for the original Xbox Live prove that online capabilities of games can be restored, but it takes people years to figure all of that stuff out. And of course, piracy of games is something that needs to be discussed as well when this topic comes up. Like I said, video game preservation is challenging. In this video, I want to cover three big questions. Why is preserving video games so important? What are the means of preserving them? And what does the future of video game preservation hold? Let's figure out the answers to all of those as we dive into the topic of the preservation of video games. Before we dive into the specifics of preserving video games, I want to quickly go over what exactly video game preservation means. Simply put, the preservation of video games is where people take steps to ensure that video games remain as accessible and playable as possible. Generally, this applies to older video games, since any new or at the very least recent games still have life to them. New or recent video games can be found in digital or physical stores. New content is still being added, or perhaps all of the content is released at a certain point, but the servers are still being maintained due to a healthy player base. When a game starts getting old though, this is when the act of preservation comes into play. Naturally, as the years go on, the game will become less and less populated. All of the content has been rolled out, server maintenance and updates aren't a priority issue, and sooner or later, any online components run the risk of becoming unavailable due to servers shutting down. Licenses may expire, resulting in the production of new physical copies copies of the game coming to a halt, along with the game in question being pulled from digital stores. Sometimes, those digital stores are entirely shut down on their own because the company deems them too costly to maintain at a certain point. As the years go on, it becomes gradually more difficult to access these titles. With preservation, the severity of losing those means of production and access is lessened. The most common form of this nowadays is when people rip the game files and put them online to be played via emulation. Since a Original consoles and copies of the game may be super difficult to find or are non-existent altogether if you go back far enough. Sometimes emulation is the only effective means of playing a video game. We also have nonprofits like the Video Game History Foundation, a group of people who go to great lengths to not only preserve video games themselves, but to teach about why this is so important. They have a research library dedicated to video games. They preserve a game's raw materials as the Video Game History Foundation puts it with source codes. They have a podcast called the Video Game History Hour, diving into a wide range of topics about all things video games. To some, myself included, this all sounds amazing to see people doing their best to preserve this unique form of media entertainment in all of its aspects. To others, though, they may look at this with confusion. Looking at this from an outsider's perspective, someone who isn't as deep into the video game hobby as I am or as other people are, it's easy to 
to see how this can be confusing for them. Why have an organization dedicated to this? Why worry about the transition from video games being primarily physical goods back then to them being primarily digital goods today? Why can't we just move on when a game either becomes extremely difficult to find and play or when a game flat out dies? Why is any of this necessary? Video games are so much more than just games. Yeah, they are video games in the literal sense. You perform inputs to have things happen, positive feedback loops are built into the game to reward you for playing, you need some sort of input like a desktop PC or a video game console, you also need an output, something like a computer screen or TV for the game to be displayed on, all of that stuff. Looking at video games beyond the fundamentals though is where their importance comes into view. Video games can be lessons about making video games. 2009's Tom Clancy's Hawks is a lesson on how personality is important. While the core gameplay may be fun, the bland personality of military talk this, military talk that, with no fleshing out of any characters, environments, or even the aircraft you fly on missions for that matter, results in the game being alright, but nothing to write home about. 2011's Ace Combat Assault Horizon is a lesson on how deviating from the strengths of a series to try to cater to the masses can result in the game being worse off in the long run. Not only is the game a betrayal to Ace Combat veterans, but the game on its own isn't terribly exceptional either. There's no meaningful progression system. The story relies on an internal political struggle in Russia featuring Russian rebels plot that had been done to death by that point in the history of video games as a whole. There's way too much hand-holding with things like dogfight mode and airstrike mode. This all results in the game being not that good. Though, credit where it's due, Assault Horizon's multiplayer saved this game from being a complete mess. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2019 is a lesson on what happens when you cater to the new players so hard that the veterans are left out to dry. Yes, developers have to make sure that any newcomers can play their game and enjoy it. However, developers also have to make sure they don't compromise the experience for the veteran players in that same breath. Modern Warfare 2019 was built from the ground up to cater heavily to the new players. The way the maps were designed, the fast time to kill, and the engagement-optimized matchmaking systems were purpose-built to give the new player an easier time at the expense of the veteran player's experience. This compromised the vision of Call of Duty, turning it into a slower-paced, more tactical FPS rather than the faster-paced, adrenaline-rush kind of FPS the series had been known for. Video games can also tell stories. Yes, they can literally tell stories through things like single-player campaigns, but I also mean stories as to how they were developed. 2016's Call of Duty Infinite Warfare tells the tale of how the game suffered from being at the right place just at the absolute worst possible time. When the game first began development in 2013, right after Ghosts, the COD fanbase's outlook on futuristic sci-fi settings was much more positive. However, by the time Infinite Warfare was ready to be shown to the world in 2016, the community was burnt out on the futuristic settings. The developers couldn't cancel the project that was two and a half years in the making at that point. They saw the tsunami wave that was the backlash in the distance as they were working on the project, and all they could do was brace themselves the best they could. How is it possible that you got this one so wrong with the fans? Where was your intel supporting this direction? This is a fantastic question. We have an extremely passionate fan base in the Call of Duty family, and we listen to every single opinion and thought you guys have about the game that we all know and love. Stop the cap. <laughs> No bullshit, bro. But ultimately, this game, Infinite Warfare, has been in the making for three years. The team feels extremely passionate about bringing a new, innovative style to the franchise while retaining the DNA and components that you love about Call of Duty. The development and post-release content of 2016's No Man's Sky tells the tale of how Sean Murray and his team at Hello Games went through absolute hell when the game was released. When the post-launch support followed, though, Sean and the others were able to change not only the perception of themselves, but of the game they made, too. 
1993's Star Fox is a story of how 3D graphics came into the spotlight for the first time in gaming. While it wasn't the first 3D game ever made, that honor going to 1980's Battlezone, this was the first time when a large audience really took notice. Utilizing the power of the Super FX chip that was born as a result of Star Fox's development, this game managed to create realistic and convincing looking 3D graphics that popped out to the player. Plus, the development of Star Fox on its own out outside of the impact its graphics had on the gaming landscape is really neat. 2008's Need for Speed Undercover tells the tale of what happens when a development studio is stretched too thin. With Black Box being split between developing Skate, Need for Speed Pro Street, and Undercover, all at the same time, it's no wonder that Undercover became the glitchy game it is today with asinine gameplay decisions that make no sense. 2017 Star Wars Battlefront 2 tells the tale of what happens when a greedy publisher pushes the envelope too far when it comes to its in-game monetization. EA mandated that a mobile game economy be put into Battlefront 2 at the game's launch with the Star Card system. This made the game blatantly pay to win, with players who had objectively better Star Cards being able to wipe the floor with players who had weaker Star Cards in comparison. After the immense backlash against EA, they removed the microtransactions. They did add them back later on, but only for the cosmetic stuff, such as victory poses, emotes, skins, and more. The star cards were given a total rework, nowadays operating on a skill point system. This was tied in with the rank system for each of the classes, vehicles, heroes and villains, and more. With each rank up, a skill point would be given that could then be used to rank up those star cards. 2002 Star Fox Adventures is another example in gaming of what happens when you deviate from a series strength for a mainline title. Trading the on-rails arcade flight action gameplay focus for a focus on ground-based melee combat, Adventures was a bit of an identity crisis for Star Fox. How Star Fox Adventures even came to be is very interesting though, since Star Fox Adventures wasn't even supposed to be a Star Fox game to begin with. Video games can also be triumphant accomplishments and achievements. These things are not easy to make, so when a video game does get successfully published, it's often a miracle that it even gets out the door in lots of cases, which makes it all the more better when the game in question is a fantastic one. Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown is a triumphant achievement for everyone over at Project Aces. This game went through development hell. Between being treated as more of a secondary offshore project by Bandai Namco when development began around 2015, up until Christmas of 2018 when it finally got the full development onshore funding treatment to how they implemented virtual reality and the many struggles that whole process had, it's a miracle that we even got this game at all, let alone how we got this game so fun, polished, and engaging. Project Wingman is a triumphant achievement given that the game was made by just three people. That's right, three People. The main person himself, Abi Ramani, the music composer, Jose Pavli, and the writer slash producer for the game, Matthew Enwen. I really hope I pronounced that last name right. If not, I am so sorry. Just three people made a kick-ass arcade flight action game that is super fun to play to this day. There's a reason why us Ace Combat fans adopted Project Wingman as one of our own. All of these lessons, stories, triumphant achievements, and more all combine to make video games something something much more than simply interactive experiences on a screen. Now, imagine all of that suddenly being executed when a game becomes unavailable to play. When a game either has its online features taken down, or is taken off a digital store entirely, or in the more nuclear case when the entire digital store gets shut down, those lessons, stories, triumphant achievements, and more go down with them. Part of the reason why people go to such lengths to preserve video games is because video games games, yes, can be fun to play, but another crucial part as to why this happens is because of those lessons, those stories, those triumphs associated with them. When a video game dies, it's not just the game that goes down, it's everything associated with it that goes down as well. This is why despite how difficult it can be at times to preserve a video game, people decide to still go through all of that trouble. Speaking of all that trouble, what's it like?
While ripping the game files from a disc and putting them up online may be the most common means of preserving a game today, there's more than one way of preserving them. The first way that was more common back then, since the information on how to do things like rip game files wasn't as widespread as it is today, was to simply keep a hold of everything physically. People to this day have entire rooms dedicated to physical video games, consoles, controllers, accessories, and more. This way of physically acquiring games and everything else is associated with them is not only still effective, but also important. Pictures and videos of these systems, controllers, accessories, etc. can only do so much. There's nothing quite like seeing these systems, controllers, accessories, game cartridges, and discs in the flesh or in the parts in this case. Same thing with game cases. While the idea of video game cases for physical copies of games is definitely an older idea nowadays, I do still appreciate being able to physically hold a game. Seeing the back of the case specifically, where all the features of the game are highlighted, is still really cool. And I will admit, part of my personal love for game cases is due to me having a bit of nostalgia for them. I still remember the Christmas that I got Ace Combat 6 Fires of Liberation for the Xbox 360 after replaying the demo which had the first mission of the campaign over and over months prior. Nowadays, the most common way of getting a game is just... Don't get me wrong, there is still excitement when buying the game and watching the progress bar fill up, but... <sighs> God, even saying that out loud, it pales in comparison to something like opening up a present that turns out to be that game you really wanted on Christmas or your birthday, or going to a place like GameStop when that was still the place to go to for games, picking out a game or two, maybe three if you were lucky, eagerly reading the back cover and the manual on your way home. <sighs> I miss being a kid. Plus, there's a legitimate benefit to owning the physical version of a game. In the case of any digital purchases of games no longer being available once a game gets pulled from stores, physical copies allow you to still play that game. Sometimes though, there is simply no other way to be able to play a game. If a company isn't willing to keep that game in question alive on their own through porting the game over or remastering it, that job becomes ours. This is where the second means of preservation comes into the picture, emulation. Despite what people may say about emulation, whether they want to recognize this fact or not, it is crucial to keeping older games alive. And for any acne-faced Reddit or Discord mods about to jump to the multi-billion dollar company's defense, first of all, put some benzyl peroxide on your face. Good god, you're gross. Second of all, the multi-billion dollar company is doing pretty good financially. A couple acquired copies of a game isn't going to hurt anyone. Besides, they're not making any sales from pre-owned stuff anyway. Third of all, it's the company's fault at the end of the day for not doing anything to preserve their games on their own. With the video game market moving from primarily physical goods to primarily digital goods, emulation is only going to get more prevalent as more games become delisted, get taken offline, pulled from stores, all of that. Not just for the improvements that emulation can provide, such as increased frame rate, graphical fixes, restoring cut content, and more, but again, also for the preservation of them to begin with. Speaking of the future of video game preservation, what does it all hold? In my eyes, the preservation of video games will become more widely recognized as the years continue. Hell, they already have been getting more widely recognized with the current shift in the gaming market we're all feeling today. And with that increased recognition comes an increased recognition to the challenges that game preservation will face in the future, if they're not already facing them now. The biggest one of them all being the change from games being primarily physical to them nowadays being primarily digital. For one, rather than releasing a full and complete game at launch, companies like to take the live service approach nowadays where the content comes out in chunks rather rather than all at once. Ideally, we would want to save every single version of a game to be able to recount firsthand how a game's entire life was spent. But 
that's just not feasible in the grand scheme of things. So, which versions do we save then? On top of that, part of these updates may involve things like application programming interfaces, aka APIs, that don't exist or are not in use anymore 15, 20, however many years down the line. So, even if all of the game files are there, a crucial piece to the puzzle may still be missing. Legal issues are a real concern as well. For example, what if a group of people got together and threw all the blood, sweat, and tears made a server to bring an online-only game back from the dead? The company who owns the intellectual property in question could very well send a cease and desist letter or skip that and go for the knockout punch with a lawsuit. In either scenario, the server gets shut down. Things such as fair use laws here in the US may be able to allow special circumventions of copyright laws, but at least to my knowledge, there haven't been any court cases that have tested that yet. And I doubt anyone is going to be volunteering as tribute to find that out anytime soon, given how expensive going to court can be. The future of video game preservation is going to be a rocky journey, for sure. There have been many cases of preservation efforts being shot down by companies, even to this very day. Most recently, Activision sent cease and desist letters to the people behind SM2 and the people behind IW4X. SM2 was going to be this big fan-made Call of Duty game similar to the Chinese exclusive Call of Duty Online, where the best elements of all the past games would be combined into their own game. IW4X was a mod that allowed people to safely play older COD multiplayers like COD 4 and the good Modern Warfare 2. Those two games, as well as many of the other older COD titles, are flat out dangerous to play on both console and PC on their own, with the security for those online games absolutely destroyed nowadays. And I do mean dangerous, as any bad actors can get your IP address, send malicious files to your computer if you're playing the game on PC. Like I said, dangerous. With Activision having sent these cease and desists, not only is perhaps the greatest Call of Duty title ever to come to fruition now dead, but relating to the topic of this video, the mod that was preserving the older games and their online multiplayers is gone. The only way to play older Call of Duty multiplayers nowadays is through the original hardware, but that method is a legitimate security risk. Having greedy corporations who see us as numbers on a spreadsheet, plus the difficulty of preserving games with the main means of acquiring them being digital now, like I said, it's going to be a rocky journey. But as corny as this may sound, I have faith. No matter what kinds of roadblocks are set in place, our determination to preserve these experiences will always, at one point or another, overpower anyone who tries to stop us. That being said, we do have to recognize the reality of the situation. The video game market is so vast and expansive that there's no way that we'll be able to save every single video game ever made. Frank Cifaldi put it best in this documentary about video game preservation when he says that it's not about trying to save every single video game to have ever been made, but rather it's to slow down the bleeding. We don't expect to actually save everything, but what we're here to do is more slow down the bleeding. We still have to give it our all to preserve any video games despite that reality. And the silver lining to that is what games we are able to preserve are all the more special as a result. To round out this video, I want to go on a little bit of a side tangent. It's still related to the topic of this video, don't worry, but I just want to talk about the one game that I hope gets revived in the future. The one game that I cite as the reason preservation needs to continue to this day. Ace Combat Infinity. If there was one game out of any other currently dead games that I could choose to revive, this would be my choice. Ace Combat Infinity was an online-only arcade flight action game that was the franchise's attempt at a free-to-play title. Originally having come under fire for it being more of a pay-to-play game given how the fuel system worked, like how energy bars work today in mobile games, Infinity didn't have the best start. However, over time, the fuel system was fixed with challenges giving additional fuel to increase playtime for each session. More content began to be added, with there being a ton of aircraft to fly, research, level up, and more. There were boss fights against the iconic Ace Combat super weapons like Stonehenge, the Solg, the Igion, each with four different variants that signaled how difficult that particular emergency sortie would be. All of the iconic Aces with their own unique jets to level up further increased the depth of the progression. I remember playing this game on and off whenever I would visit my dad. 
the PlayStation 3 was over at his house, so I didn't get to play the game every day, or as much as I would have liked looking back on it now. When Infinity servers were officially shut down on March 31st, 2018, I didn't realize just how much I would miss this game later on. It's been a little over five years since Infinity was shut down, and since then, any theoretical revival of this game has actually made some progress. According to what I've seen online, Ace Combat Infinity has already been successfully emulated. It's the server's connection that has had people stumped for so long. Because this was an online-only game, not even the single player can be accessed without a connection. The furthest that people have gotten is getting to the failed connection error message screen after getting through the title screen. I'm not going to pretend that I know anything about creating a server, let alone one that would be strong enough to allow thousands of Ace Combat veterans to return to this game. But seeing that there's a possibility of this game being revived, this one major hurdle that needs to be cleared, it makes me want to start learning, you know? I'll dial it back a bit because at this point, this is turning into an Ace Combat Infinity video now. However, you could probably tell that I really, really want this game to come back. For anyone whose game in question they would choose to revive is different, you can take that feeling of yearning and apply it to whichever game you have in mind. Not only can we use that yearning as fuel to potentially bring back those older titles, but we can also use that feeling to preserve what we have today. Like I said earlier in the video, video games are so much more than just games. They are lessons, experiences, and triumphs. However many games we can preserve as the future becomes the present, we'll be able to also preserve those lessons, those experiences, and those triumphs.